Hello, I'm Paul Floyd, a military analyst here at Stratfor, and today I'm joined by Lily Baer, a Eurasia analyst, and we'll be discussing the most recent events in Ukraine. Lily, uh, in Ukraine, the most recent thing we've been seeing is a series of elections politically, um, and their outcome has kind of solidified uh, certain political ends for both sides of the conflict in Ukraine. And if you could speak to that, please. So over the past few weeks, we actually t had two sets of elections. We had one set of elections in Ukraine run by the national government. Um, they were parliamentary elections. And then a week later, on November 2nd, we had unrecognized elections both in the Luhansk People's Republic and in the self-declared Donetsk People's Republic. And what all these elections actually have in common is that they weren't really about um, you know, a change in leadership. They were really about solidifying and consolidating the power of leaderships already in place and in giving all of these leaderships a perceived legitimacy in the eyes of their constituents. Well, this begs the question, in Ukraine's recent you know, history of the last decade and what we're seeing right now, is the, the, the political volatility. Uh, and so is this really uh, stability or, or is this just a veneer? So for the time being, this is actually stability. Um, the Kiev government, uh, which will be formed officially over the next few weeks, will probably be a coalition of uh, two major pro-Western parties, one of them the People's Front led by uh, current Prime Minister Yatsenyuk, the other one, Petro Poroshenko Bloc, of course, was founded by uh, the current President Petro Poroshenko. And these two parties, along with a few smaller pro-Western parties, will uh, likely form a coalition and govern together. Um, they are uh, rallying around the pro-Western um, ideals that brought them to office at this time. Uh, they're very pro-EU and they they have all pledged to work uh, toward EU um, integration, integration toward uh, with Western institutions. So on the short run, it seems like these parties uh, will be united. But on the long term, there will be some challenges to uh, this coalition. But over time, divisions can emerge. And one issue in particular where divisions can emerge um, on the long run is austerity and Ukraine's financial challenges, because Ukraine right now is receiving a lot of funding from the IMF and from the European Union, but that will likely not be enough. And they will either need to get more aid uh, from international institutions or made, make significant cutbacks. And even with uh, aid from the IMF, they will likely need more austerity measures, which can create tensions within the ruling coalition. So for Moscow, uh, with a large strategic aim of making sure there's not a pro-Western government in Kiev, or at least the ability to negate some of the actions Kiev could take in a pro-Western sort of way, it doesn't have this short-term political lever. And besides hoping that they can politically drive that factionalization as you talk and, 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 and exacerbate that, what other tools do they have that could help them in, in this ongoing conflict? So the energy tool um, that Russia has in Ukraine is still uh, very much valid. Last week, we had a temporary natural gas deal between Russia's Gazprom and Ukraine's Naftogaz uh, for Russia to provide about uh, 4 billion cubic meters of natural gas to Ukraine uh, from November until March. However, um, negotiations will continue and the two sides will actually go to international arbitration uh, to try to sort out their differences over pricing and debt. Um, so although on the short run, um, the energy issue has been taken care of and you can will have natural gas through the winter, Russia still retains a very powerful lever through energy supplies. I would add to that, uh, on top of that, would be the military lever. You know, they've already exercised certain portion, you know, the, through their military support of the separatists in, in the Donbass region, they, they've kind of separated a chunk of the country away. And currently the lines have solidified. There's a ceasefire in place. Um, you know, fighting has been, in a large sense, quieted down. We're not having the big territorial changes that we've seen. But what has, uh, there still has been fighting over very specific places like uh, around Donetsk Airport, um, around Dabaltsev and that critical junction of main roads there, um, and around Luhansk. 
And we're also, and what we're seeing both from native reports um, and, and just in, in the social media is lots of, of, of reporting about supply, heavy supplies, um, almost an uptick in the supply and around these areas. Begging this question of, of what exactly is the intent militarily, is Russia going to, to restart military options? Because as you say, its energy and political options are, are temporarily at least kind of limited. Um, it, it's hard to derive intent from what they're doing because they have many options. Um, you know, a, a military logistics buildup does not mean that we're going to go on the offensive, but it does give them that ability. Um, it also could just be them making sure that the separatists uh, have control of that region and, and will ha- continue to have control through a winter where logistics will be constrained. So it, it might just be about making sure that in a military sense, the lines that have been drawn during the ceasefire stay that way, that Ukraine cannot grab territory in, in a surprise attack. Um, that being said, it still, does, like uh, to, to reemphasize, it does leave that option for, for Moscow. You know, if they need to and they feel like they have no other choice, they can uh, push out in the military offensive. But I would say there's probably some political constraints to, to the idea of, of Moscow uh, encouraging the separatists to, to get very aggressive militarily. Absolutely. Russia is leaving its options open, but the Kremlin is constrained domestically. Uh, We've seen the value of Russia's currency, the ruble, plummet over the past few months, forcing the central bank uh, to take some pretty dramatic measures. And we've also seen oil prices going down, uh, something which is having a significant impact on Russia's budget, thus limiting uh, Russia's ability to spend as much as it had hoped for on uh, defense, on uh, energy companies and energy projects. Um, And Russia is uh, in a position where it has to keep social spending up and constant in order to maintain the support of the Russian population. And at the same time, the Russian population is against a direct intervention in Ukraine. So um, any kind of overt uh, intervention going beyond what the separatists control now uh, would have negative domestic consequences for the Kremlin. Well, thank you, Lily. Uh, that's been very informative. For any further questions on this or further material, please visit stratfor.com.